All right. It seems like our attendees are coming into the space. And so as you do, I'll begin a welcome. My name um, is Shannon Jackson. I'm Associate Vice Chancellor for the Arts and Design, and it's a privilege to welcome students, colleagues, and community to another iteration of A Plus D Mondays, our weekly series that features the people and ideas, the movements and practices that most compel the Berkeley faculty, our students, staff, and community. As many of you know by now, this series is co-curated by a range of campus organizations, including the African American Student Development Office, Berkeley Center for New Media, Cal Performances, the Grad School of Journalism, um, the Arts Advocates at Berkeley Law, and many others. Tonight, we have the privilege of co-hosting with the Department of Art, Art Practice as, as part of their as, as part of their Weisenfeld lecture series. Um, and also, this is coming to you as an event on Zoom, thanks to the incredible guidance and support of A plus D's own Paris Coates, our program coordinator. I want to tell you more about the two luminous artists who will be gathering uh, with us tonight. But before I do, I want to acknowledge the land on which we gather, the politics of the land on which we gather here um, as a campus. UC Berkeley is sited on the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone tribe. As we convene on this campus, online and offline, we recognize not only the deep and rich history of this land, the Ohlone history of this land, but also that the Ohlone people are flourishing members of the Berkeley community and of Bay Area communities more widely. Tonight, we will get to hear from artists who think deeply about the politics of gathering, as well as what it means to memorialize or counter memorialize the histories that have transpired on shared land. We will get to hear from two luminous artists, Kenyatta A.C. Hinkle and Lava Thomas. Let me briefly introduce their capacious biographies. Kenyatta A.C. Hinkle is an interdisciplinary artist, writer, and performer. Her practice fluctuates between participatory projects in community-based galleries to intimate projects based upon her private experiences of historical events. Guided by a mantra focused on the historical present, she examines the residue of history and how it affects our contemporary world perspective. Her artwork and experimental writing has been exhibited and performed at numerous places, including the Studio Museum of Harlem, Project Row Houses, the Hammer Museum, SF MoMA, and many other spaces. Her work has been reviewed by the Los Angeles Times, Art Forum, Hyperallergic, Huffington Post, Washington Post, the New York Times, and many others. And she's the recipient of several awards, including the Fulbright Fellowship, SF MoMA Seco, Seco Award, and more. Her works are in the permanent collections of the Studio Museum of Harlem, SF MoMA, and many others. Her writing has appeared in uh, a number of publications, uh, and she is also the author of several texts, including um, the book, Kentrifications, Convergent Truths and Realities. She will be joined in dialogue with Lava Thomas. Whether creating memorials to victims of racial violence, illuminating the labor of women and struggle for civil rights, or stretching the conventions of portraiture and representation, Lava Thomas's practice amplifies ideas that center visibility, resilience, and empowerment in the face of erasure, trauma, and oppression. Her oath includes drawing, painting, photography, and site-specific installations. She explores the events, figures, and movements that inform and shape our individual and collective histories. Thomas is also the recipient of many awards, including the 2020 San Francisco Artadia Award, the Joan Mitchell Grant, Lucas Artist Fellowships in Visual Arts. She has participated in numerous residencies, including the Headland Center for the Arts and Facebook LA. Venues where Thomas's work has been exhibited nationally include the National Portrait Gallery, the International Print Center, the Museum of the African Diaspora, the California African American Museum, the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts, and more. Her work is held in the permanent collections of the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the United States Consulate General in South Africa, the Studio Museum in Harlem, SF MoMA, the Berkeley Art Museum Pacific Film um, Archive, and many others. Her work has been reviewed in art form, New York Times, Hyperallergic, 
The Guardian, SF Chronicle, and many others. Yes, many others. We welcome tonight two artists who embrace many, many movements, practices, forms, histories, and memories. Two artists who couldn't be better positioned to contribute to a Monday night series focused on the aesthetics of togetherness. So even if you're muted, please do your best to send the warmest of welcomes to Kenyatta A.C. Hinkle and to Lava Thomas. Thank you. Kenyatta, you need to unmute your, okay. <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. There she is. <laughs> Yay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, okay, let's go into this. Let me pull up my screen. Um, I can't see myself um, presenting or, or speaking to you all, and I can't see you all either. Um, but I'm really, really delighted to be here today um, presenting on public art and protests is such a timely subject matter. And this event was actually scheduled to go on in the spring of, um, yeah, last semester, but of course COVID and so many things happened and transpired, um, which to be honest, gave us even more to talk about and to pull into this conversation. So thank you so much for tuning in um, this evening. And I'm very, very excited um, to have you all here in this space. And especially on election eve, I know that it's a lot of feelings, emotions, anxiety. So I'm just gonna kind of take a deep breath because we're gonna go in tonight. Um, I would like to thank um, Shannon Jackson for the amazing introduction. Thank you so much for that. Um, Paris Coates for all of our work behind the scenes, Maya Chan, just all of the work behind the scenes with graphic design, Eric Nelson and Dylan Thomas, um, the Department of Art Practice, we the Weisenfeld Lecture Series, um, providing the resources and the opportunity to curate this has been just absolutely phenomenal and to see the impact that it's having on students and the larger audiences that are tuning in is just a dream come true. Okay, so let's go in. I would like to start with a Lucille Clifton quote. Um, they ask me to remember, but they want me to remember their memories and I keep on remembering mine. For me, I think this is a pivotal quote that sets up this whole tone of um, what we're experiencing in this current political moment. This idea of erecting um, a monument onto a piece of land, onto a geography in which um, genocide and various acts of violence um, and the residue of history kind of stand. And what does it mean to, to continue to resist forgetting, forgetting your own memories, forgetting what transpired in the land? So I love this quote because it always creates some kind of accountability for me to continue to tell my, tell my side of history, to tell my history. These are some essential questions that um, we want to frame tonight's discussion around. Initially, tonight's event was supposed to be a workshop, but obviously we're not in person. So at this moment, I would like to encourage everyone, wherever you're at, to take a screenshot of the screen. These are questions that you can continue to unpack later. You can put them up in your studio, creative spaces, wherever you're working. You can discuss them with loved ones, family members. For me, art has the power to create conversations outside of just objects or things that, that we make. So I would love for you all to really spend some time with these essential questions. The first one being, how do monuments impact the psyches of the geographies in which they are placed? What narratives do monuments continually assert? How does one create a a monument that is reparative or is a means to begin the balancing of the scales of history? How do we stand in solidarity with reimagining the possibilities for monuments in the face of an insistence upon historical amnesia 
slash purposeful forgetting. What happened? We got a phone call that you're trying to steal this vehicle. No, that bullshit. They lied to you. I discovered this car. I discovered. I'm discovering this car. This gentleman right here is telling me. Yeah, I went inside to get some water. I left my car out here in front of my driveway. And he's and he You bullshit. You lied. There's no your car no more. I discovered it. You lying. Sir, you can't discover a car. What do you mean? I fight. It's here. It's open. I get inside. I discover the car. It's my car now. Uh, what day is today? Today is Columbus Day. Okay, and what he do? He discovered America. Bullshit, because somebody was over here. I get, how are you going to discover something because alguien estaba allá? And what the first country he discovered? He discovered Dominican Republic and Haiti. First. No, bullshit, because Pefita told me she was there already, colando café when he got there. So why you lie? Sir, sir, I need you to get out of the car. I sir. cannot get I discovered it. No, but this, I dis this, Listen, I'm this, busy. I have somewhere to go. I discovered this car. I have to leave. There, I'm sorry sir, this you. is not your vehicle. It's mine now because I discovered, Mr. Officer. I'm trying to explain to you. Sir, I need you to get Tell out of the vehicle. Tell him I'm leaving. So okay, this so is he this <laughs> um, this clip um, has been viral for quite some time. And I love this alternative telling of, of history and what transpired and how the person in the vehicle is actually tasking the person who is filming. Um, what is their own relationship to history and the master narrative that they know and that and they follow? and that they continue to believe. And um, it's just so compelling every time to, to, to watch that clip. Um, so this first part of the talk, I'm kind of framing our discussion around just a lot of thoughts that have been circulating in my head in relationship to my own practice. And in this moment, I've been thinking about the various forms of how people have been remixing and reimagining uh, structures of violence um, that are within their everyday um, geographies and their relationships to those everyday geographies. Um, a lot of images that have been floating around on the internet have been simply just arresting and haunting within their own rights and it's been really, really powerful to kind of sit with a lot of these things to even look at this statue of Christopher Columbus that has been beheaded. And I've been thinking about um, what does it mean to topple? What does it mean to overthrow? What does it mean to create a, a palimpest of resistance um, and resistance in real time so that you can kind of see the layers of history in our moment right now bleeding into each other and clashing with each other in really powerful visual ways. I'm really taken by this image with the kind of colonial aggression architecture in the background in relationship to all of these cords and threads trying to pull um, this general tipping their hat. Um, it's just, this is a very eerie moment that we're in right now. And I wanna make sure that during this time I can continue to witness and to think about all of these, um, these poetics. So I'm just gonna cycle through these. I really love everything about this image <laughs> for the most part, but there is something interesting too about all of the cameras right now, how people are documenting these moments of history and then those documentations become viral. And so there's the witnessing that is happening globally at this moment. It's a shared moment in ways that technology would not have permit permitted in other ways. I also love how people, artists, creatives, healers are also uh, asserting themselves within these remix monuments and spaces. And, and as I said, it becomes a palimpest of various moments and relationships to history, time and space. And for me, it's just so powerful. I have this theory about shifting the audience from spectator to witness. So a spectator is someone that looks at the wreck or looks at the, the, the moment of violence and they recount their memory to talk about how it inconvenienced them or for shock value. Whereas a witness, they recount their memory in relationship to justice, seeking justice for people who are not in a position to, to recount the story for themselves. So a lot of these, um, 
these monuments coming down and the recontextualizing of them, for me, I see it as an active point of ongoing witnessing. I really, really love this cardboard placard that is covering, attempting to cover or to um, obstruct the view of what this monument that is, or this placard um, beneath this didactic is also um, stating about history or the importance of this figure and why they need to remain. Um, this plaque is dedicated to the slaves that were taken from their homes. I'm really interested in how do we create spaces for the unknown, the unnamed, um, even to be honest, the undead, the unrested, people who were not able to receive justice. This is a, a TED talk that I absolutely love to share with my students, um, with fellow artists. Um, I think it's really beautiful because Lava and I will be in a group show with uh, Titus Kapar. And so I'm gonna play just a small clip um, of, this, of this TED talk. I love museums. Have you guys ever been to the Natural History Museum? Oh, yeah. in, the oh, yeah. in New York City? So, one of the things that I do is I take my kids to the museum. Recently, took them to the Natural History Museum. Have my two sons with me, Savian and Davin. And we go into the front entrance of the museum, and there's that amazing sculpture of Teddy Roosevelt out there. You guys know which one I'm talking about. Teddy Roosevelt is sitting there with one hand on the horse, bold, strong, sleeves rolled up. I don't know if he's bare-chested, but it kind of feels like it. <laughs> and on the left-hand side of him is a Native American walking. And on the right-hand side of him is an African American walking. And as we're moving up the stairs, getting closer to the sculpture, my oldest son, who's nine, says, Dad, how come he gets to ride and they have to walk? It stopped me in my tracks. It stopped me in my tracks. There was so much history <laughs> that we would have to go through to try to explain that. And that's something I tried to, try to do with them anyways. That's a question that I probably would have, would have never really asked. But fundamentally what he was saying was, that doesn't look fair. Dad, that doesn't look fair. And why is this thing that's so not fair sitting outside of such an amazing institution? And this question got me wondering, is there a way for us to amend our public sculptures, our national monuments? Not erase them, but is there a way to amend them? I think that's such a, a powerful question um, that has haunted me ever since I, I watched that, that TED Talk. I really encourage people to go watch it in its entirety because it's absolutely powerful and um, arresting in so many ways. And um, we're gonna dig deeper into this question, um, especially when Lava presents. Um, very quickly, I want to kind of talk about my experiences as a child in relationship to monuments um, that aren't necessarily uh, figurative or statue-based or in um, a, a kind of traditional sense of monumentality that we think about. I remember being in elementary school and I'm from Louisville, Kentucky and we visited my old Kentucky home and it was a plantation. And it was so interesting being this little black child and walking around this whole home and how it was preserved and just hearing all of the stories about the, the debutantes who lived there, the really powerful people who had a lot of relationships to politics and wealth, and, but no mention um, really of the enslaved individuals that looked just like me. Um, and I remember it being a very eerie and arresting um, experience walking room to room and seeing all of these portraits and these furnishings. And, and at the time, obviously I wasn't um, 
deeply entrenched in the scholarship that I am now, but somehow I knew that there was something absolutely um, not okay with this preservation of this, this big house. And the whole time I kept feeling haunted by the presences that were in the space, the people um, who, who literally built the structure, but were rarely mentioned. And I've also been thinking about a lot of plantations as, as monuments within themselves, as functional monuments and people getting married um, at a lot of these sites and um, haunted tourism, dark tourism, people going to um, experience these kind of haunted landscapes and these landscapes that were erected on top of um, uh, indigenous land. And I like to think of even architecture, colonial architecture, these are all monuments within themselves, monuments to enslavement and how America became uh, such a powerful nation. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, there's a project that I've been following called the Unknown Project. Um, there's a woman in Louisville, Kentucky named Hannah Drake, and um, she's a part of this nonprofit called the Ideas X Lab. So currently she's working on a monument um, for the enslaved unknown individuals. And it is a monument in which, where I was born and raised, Louisville, Kentucky is on one side of, of the Ohio River. And when you look across to the other side, you can see Indiana or Ohio. So the Ohio River became this liminal boundary. Um, Kentucky was a slave state, Indiana and Ohio um, were free states um, until the Fugitive Slave Law Act in which um, slave owners, slave masters could come and procure their property. And I always, as a child, would just look across that boundary and it's such an abstract relationship to freedom and enslavement. And so for this project, she is creating multiple um, benches that will outline um, the outskirts of the river so that instead of it being um, a monument or figurative in that way, um, it's a place of reflection where people can sit and really contemplate this unfathomable relationship between these boundaries. Um, another project, um, an instance of public art and protest that has haunted me for a long time is Sam Durant's Scaffold in uh, 2017, which is um, it's a combination of seven different um, hangman's gallows that were used to, to execute um, indigenous people, Native American people. Um, and it was shown abroad um, in Europe. And then when it came back to the States, it was placed at the Walker. And the Dakota, people from the D Dakota tribe um, were outraged and so many others in the community um, were outraged by this instrument of death, this instrument of genocide being placed in on the land in which that's where it transpired. And so there was a lot of controversy around this monument and it was very interesting to watch how everything unfolded. And within a lot of this, um, Sam Durant, he started working with the, um, the Dakota tribe and really trying to see how this intense moment um, could be, it's just, oh my gosh, it's so, it's, it's, it's so hard um, how it could be rectified. And so he um, gave creative license and ownership of this, um, of this piece to the Dakota tribe so that they could um, dismantle it and do what they saw fit. Um, but a lot that's missing from the conversation that I think is what was the Walker's um, relationship to, you know, commissioning a project like this or, or not having um, discussions with the community and creating programming and education before they even took on a project of this nature. And um, it also makes me question, what does it mean to make very um, difficult, problematic work what does it mean for a monument or um, something that is made in relationship to um, 
being a witness that is shifted into spectatorship and what is the power of the medium that you're working with um can something like this ever be about witnessing because it was about um public execution and death so it was about spectatorship and spectatorship of power so what does that mean and this is an image of um, a lot of the protests that transpired. I've also been thinking about, um, oh my gosh, why am I blanking on it? Now I, I more so think about um, Hannah Black's uh, protests of Black Death Spectacle um, in which the Whitney Biennial, um, there was a painting, um, portrayed of a painting of Emmett Till in his casket done by an artist that um, was Caucasian. And it really brought this larger question, what does it mean to depict the dead? What does it mean to take this moment of protest in which Mammy Till um, decided that her son needed to have an open casket and that the photograph needed to be taken and published and be distributed all over the nation, all over the world, so that people could witness the, the terror of white supremacy. What does that mean for that to be painted and put into um, the Whitney Museum, into this space? What does it mean to um, different people's relationship to that historical moment? And for me, this becomes a meta, 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 meta form of, of protest and, and reckoning and also straddling that line between spectator and witness. Um, I should have given content warning before this slide. I know that this image can be triggering um, to a lot of individuals. Weaving back in my personal uh, history, I um, when I was in middle school, there was a a kid that showed up with a Confederate belt buckle. And I remember being so angry and, and my fellow classmates being so upset and just wondering like, why would you wear that to school? Why is that even allowed here? Like the idea of the, of the terror that the Confederate flag represented um, to us as individuals, as descendants of enslaved um, people in Louisville, Kentucky. And so it got me thinking about, can a monument, does a monument even need to be a statue? Does a monument even need to be a plantation? How can a monument be a form of um, adornment? And what do you do with this loaded adornment? So um, I did this Google search as I'm trying to like conjure up this memory of um, what transpired. And so I found all of these different versions of um, Confederate belt buckles. And so what does it mean to carry a monument on your body? Um, and, and what does that monument mean for different people? For some people, it may be a source of pride and for some people, it may be a source of sheer terror. Um, Lakeith Stanfield in um, Atlanta remixing um, this hat with the Confederate flag that says Southern Made. Um, he takes a marker and a Sharpie, well, Sharpie, and he reconfigures it to say, you mad. And so it was something so interesting about the belt buckle with the child from school, and then kind of seeing this Confederate flag be reconfigured, depending on whose body it is, it's on. Um, I was scrolling through Facebook. Um, I really, really absolutely adore this poet, Bridget Bianca. She's the author of Be Trouble. And she was wearing a shirt created by Last Bison Standing, an organization run by students and alums from Howard as a fundraising effort during the civil unrest. And I had seen the, you know, a man was, a black man was lynched by the police yesterday and followed that whole trajectory and even Dred Scott reconfiguring that. But it was something so powerful in the wake of Breonna Taylor to see her wearing this shirt on her body. Um, for me, that this is monumental. Um, it's, it goes back to the Lucille Clifton quote that I keep wanting to remember my memories. Um, lastly, two more slides. This is from my SF MoMA show entitled They. And uh, for me, it was a very prophetic show because it really um, stirred up a lot of um, things that are that 
started to transpire. Um, it's literally been a year um, since install. And um, I just keep thinking about um, the NSARS movement going on in uh, Nigeria at this moment. In October, 2019, I had reconfigured this um, Lagos police cord. And I just knew that I had to have all these snakes and various configurations coming in and out. So I was thinking a lot about corruption. I was thinking a lot about colonial architecture being placed um, as a form of dominance onto indigenous land. And it was so interesting how all of these parallels started coming together. Okay. Um, so a lot of this talk was inspired by sisterhood. So now um, in sisterhood between Maya Angelou and Toni Morrison. And so I am now going to hand the reins over to Lava Thomas so that she can um, do her part of the presentation. Thank you. Can you put my... <laughs> Thank you, Kenyatta. I'm thrilled to be here with all of you tonight. Thank you, Kenyatta A.C. Hinkle for inviting me to be in conversation in this last of the Weisenfeld Lecture Series. I'd like to thank UC Berkeley Art and Design and the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Art Archive for hosting this event. Bear with me. This shouldn't be happening. You might have to manually click with that bar on the bottom. I don't know why, but that might just be what has to happen. That last image of Dr. Maya Angelou and Toni Morrison takes me back to August 9th, 2019, just days after Toni Morrison's death when we finalists made our presentations to the selection panel for a sculpture to honor Dr. Maya Angelou for the San Francisco Main Library. Kenyatta was one of the finalists and we were acutely aware of the profound responsibility as black women artists standing on the shoulders of their genius and accomplishment as we waited to be called in to make our presentations. My proposal ended up receiving top ranking that day and the congratulations that I received from Kenyatta was both heartfelt and gracious. But that selection on August 9th of last year wasn't approved until just hours ago. Over the course of this past year leading up to today's vote to finally approve my proposal, my work and voice have been at the center of conversations around censorship, representation, racial and cultural equity in public art in the Bay Area. So I'm going to share some of the images from my proposal presentation and discuss the critical role that protest and activism by black women artists and allies, that role was pivotal to finally bring justice forward. I'm also going to talk about how disparate communities coalesce to forge the path for justice to be served. Portrait of a Phenomenal Woman introduces a new icon to the city of San Francisco with a representation of Dr. Angelo that didn't already exist in the public's consciousness. A monument that would allow her to be seen and experienced in a fresh and contemporary way. A monument whose formal and conceptual choices were driven by Dr. Angelo's own words, how she defined herself, her values, and the overarching philosophy of her life and work. 
the monument's title, Portrait of a Phenomenal Woman, is from Dr. Angelo's poem, Phenomenal Woman, a power de powerful declaration of self in which she asserts her beauty, her magic, and her pride, proclaiming herself as phenomenal in a society that persistently attempts to dehumanize black and brown people required and requires still unassailable courage. The monument takes the form of a book fabricated in bronze and stands at a total height of nine feet. A portrait of Dr. Angelo translated from an original drawing in bas relief appears on the book's cover with her name in bold letters on its spine. The monument's book form serves as a symbolic repository of her life and works conceptually and physically tying the monument to its site at the library. The quote on the back of the monument and letters large enough to cover its surface illustrate how reading and information cultivate empathy and understanding, necessary qualities to counter ignorance and intolerance. The human drama that unfolds in literature helps us to see our common humanity with greater clarity. Dr. Angelo's insistence that we are more alike than unalike is an underlying philosophy of her life and works. I write about the black experience, she says, but I am always talking about the human condition. Dr. Angelo's portrait is based on stills from the author's 1973 interview with Bill Moyers, which was conducted when she lived in Berkeley. The year 1973 is significant as it resonates with present day politics. 1973 was the year that Roe versus Wade was written into law. 1973 was the year that the Nixon impeachment hearings began. By then, Dr. Angelo had achieved international recognition as an author, poet, film director, activist, and humanitarian. When Bill Moyers asked what price she paid for her freedom, the freedom to work, travel, and live so expansively, she answered, the price is high the reward is great. At some point you realize you are only free when you belong no place, you belong every place. When Bill Moyers asked if she belonged to anyone, she answered, I belong to myself. And this portrait wearing a short Afro and hoop earrings, Maya Angelou epitomizes the black as beautiful aesthetic. This is a generative portrait that captures her human interiority and complexity with a nuanced expression that can be interpreted differently by each person that encounters it. The portrait conveys her fierceness, her softness, her strength, her beauty, and her vulnerability. It not only transcends the decade from which, it, which it's based, it projects a timeless presence into the future. Bronze has long been the material choice for commemorative monuments for its association with conquest, grandeur and permanence. My choice for bronze, however, was inspired by the Benin bronze plaques of West Africa, created by the Edo people, whose indigenous metallurgy technologies date back to the 13th century. I was also inspired by Elizabeth Catlett's memorial to Ralph Ellison, Invisible Man, a bronze monolith that stands in Harlem. Portrait of a Phenomenal Woman embraces the rectangularity of these works and situates itself in black art, not the European figurative tradition that Confederate and colonial monuments are based on. After the selection panel deliberated on August 9th, I was informed that my proposal was selected and that it would be approved in the next visual arts committee meeting as a matter of course. Instead, two weeks later, I received a call informing me that the project sponsors preferred a more figurative work and that my proposal wasn't approved. So I did what any self-respecting artist would do. I wrote a scathing letter, which was the first in a series of letters that I've written over the past year. And via social media, I rallied folks to attend the next visual arts committee meeting to protect the integrity of the selection process, to seek answers and to make public comments. During the meeting, Supervisor Stephanie stepped forward as the legislative sponsor and rejected the selection panel's choice. She then ordered the Visual Arts Committee to shut down the project and start over, insisting that Dr. Angelo be honored with a traditional statue. 
She said, as I carried the legislation across the finish line to elevate women in monuments, I wanted to do it in the same way that men have historically been elevated in the city. Her demands weaponized European aesthetics and conventions of statuary to perpetuate the systemic and persistent erasure of black women's intellectual and creative labor. Now this was the first time in San Francisco's history that a critical mass of black women were invited to participate in a process to select an artist to honor an exceptional black woman with a public sculpture. I spoke out condemning the decision along with several members of the Bay Area Arts Committee who, community who attended the meeting, including members of the selection panel. Taking to social media again, I urged the Bay Area arts community to write Mayor Breed and Catherine Stephanie in protest. The story was covered by international and local press, which sparked community outrage. Ashara Ekandayo Gallery hosted a conversation that was moderated by Dr. Lee Rayford, Associate Professor of African American Studies at UC Berkeley which included Angela Hennessy, Associate Professor of Art at California College of the Arts, who was on the selection panel, and Dana King, an artist whose public monuments were commissioned by the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama, and myself. We spoke to a standing room only crowd. Community activism grew out of that November meeting, along with the creation of See Black Women Collective, spearheaded by Zahira Rashid and Angela Hennessy, and co-founded co also by Dana King and Jamani Montague. We will not allow a white woman to dictate the representation of black women in the public realm was our mantra. The Arts Commission attempted to sweep the fiasco under the rug and issued a new RFQ for the Maya Angelou Monument in January, 2020. Artists boycotted the 2020 RFQ or asked permission to use my images in their submittals. But in the wake of Black Lives Matter uprisings with monuments to white supremacy being toppled and removed, not only in San Francisco, but around the world, monuments were back in the public consciousness after the city's removal of Christopher Columbus's monument and protesters toppling monuments to Francis Scott Key and Unipero Serra, Mayor Breed called for an audit of San Francisco's monuments to determine which should be removed and which should stay. I challenged the city's monument strategy during the Visual Arts Committee meeting in July, arguing that the San Francisco Arts Commission needed to also deal with its mismanagement and systemic racism in regards to the 2019 Maya Angelou monument fiasco. But I was cut off before I finished my statement. Uproar ensued with members of the public calling for me to be allowed to finish my statement, but their requests were ignored. So I took to social media again. I will not be silenced. I collaborated with C Black Women Collective on a campaign to end white supremacy at the SFAC and to end the prioritization of European conventions of statuary to represent Black women in the public realm. The campaign mobilized artists and activists to pressure the Arts Commission to suspend the reissued 2020 RFQ and to take action toward redress and restorative justice for the egregious way in which the 2019 RFQ was mishandled and for the continued dismissal, disrespect and disregard of black women's labor and expertise. The campaign provided specific instructions for people to make public comments during the next full Arts Commission meeting. Artists and allies from all over the country wrote letters, made calls and spoke out during that meeting. Actions toward redress and restorative justice included a public apology and the adoption of best practices and cultural equity guidelines. The Visual Arts Commission issued a public apology during the full commission meeting. And after two hours of public comments, 
primarily mobilized by See Black Women Collective, the full commission voted to cease the 2020 RFQ. The story was covered in the Times, which raised national awareness about the fiasco and was a catalyst for talks to have my monument erected in front of the library where it was originally selected for. I eventually met with Mayor London Breed and Supervisor Stephanie, where Mayor Breed took responsibility and apologized. Supervisor Stephanie made a public apology during this past October's Visual Arts Committee meeting, and she recommended that my proposal be approved almost a year to the day after my proposal was rejected. It took an entire village led by black women who would not allow the injustice to go unanswered. And earlier today, the full commission voted to terminate the reissued 2020 RFQ and to approve the 2019 panel selections choice of my proposal, justice. It's been a long time coming. Thank you. Oh my gosh, yay! <laughs> Can we just like celebrate? Yes, 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 do the chat, do the chat. Go off in the chat, yes. I love it how everybody's like, oh, amazing, yeah. <laughs> it's so exciting that like today is literally like the day that- Today, this was just, this was just hours ago. And so my, this is a double header for me. My day has been pretty full. <laughs> <laughs> I know, at 2 p.m. And you're like, everybody, get on here and see them, you know, like, you know, cancel everything. And that, I mean, I don't even know where to begin because there were so many different ways that we wanted to approach. How do we talk about public art and protest? And through listening to you, like, and first of all, I loved your voice while you were reading it. And they did this. And they did that. <laughs> I'm like, yes, Lava, this is a performance within itself. Like, I just love how, for me, I'm really inspired by what art has the power to do. It's not about these objects that we make. For me, the power is when people go out into the community and they talk about it. So as painful as this whole process has been and, and triggering for so many fellow creative Black women artists, like you were just standing for everybody, for the history, for all of it, all of the injustices. I'm actually happy that it transpired in the way that it did because if it would have happened in a total different way, we wouldn't have been able to see the depth of the depth and the persistence of this erasure and the violence of, you know, trying to force this, this woman who literally could not be put into a box, like she could not be put into a box, refused to be put in a box. She said, I belong to myself, literally. Yeah. And this insistence to say, no, she has to be depicted like all the other white male, cisgendered, heteronormative individuals throughout time you know like what does that mean and to see you know the city of san francisco double down upon that with this whole environment that you know we're progressive we're forward thinking this is a, a city you know for artists for for ideas in the midst of so much gentrification in the midst of people not even being able to really afford living here especially creatives so it was such I keep saying pal and pest. It was a pal and pest of so many injustices all just in one. And so if it didn't transpire the way that it did, we wouldn't be able to have the, conversa the conversation in depth in this way. And through your journey, it's like you had to like embody Maya and <laughs> everything that she stood for. It's like your actions were monumental within itself. That, that's my take on it. And I know it was very painful, 
but I, I don't know. I'm, we're both mamas. Like when you're giving birth, it's painful, <laughs> but it, 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 it's something new that's coming forward. And, you know, your life will never be the same. And so I can't help but to keep thinking about that, about those resonances with your like long journey, but how it uncovered so much within that journey that we all needed to see. You know, for me, yes, it was painful. And honestly, I couldn't have made this journey um, alone. There were so many times when I just wanted to drop it. And, and honestly, there was also a long period of time where I didn't even want to deal with the Arts Commission if they would have, in fact, which they eventually did, um, but if they would have awarded it to me after all of the um, disrespect, disregard, dismissal, erasure, after all of that, the several people ask, you know, if they change their mind, would you take it? If it, you know, and for a very long time, I said no. Right. What you know, what's been interesting for me, and what's uh, becoming clearer, I'm, a, I'm clear to me now. I'm a slow processor. Um, but it was almost as if I needed to go through this ordeal in order to lift up justice, because I don't know if you remember, but during the orientation, um, I asked Maya Angelou's son, how would how would Maya Angela like to be remembered? And he said, she would like to be remembered as a woman who stood for justice. Yes. So as the universe would have it, I ended up, and not just me, but every black woman who was outraged mm -hmm. that, that this, you know, this, this like, I don't know how else to describe this, but that this woman, this supervisor, Stephanie, and it wasn't just Stephanie because Stephanie inherited this legislation from the supervisor prior, Mark Farrell, and his aides were the ones who actually wrote the, the legislation and were inspired um, to write legislation to create um, not just a monument to Maya Angelou, but monuments to women around San Francisco, because they're really, they're only out of 87 monuments to men, they're only two monuments to women. So their intentions, their very liberal intentions um, were, um, were good intentions, mm -hmm. but Neither of no one, no one in the room when those decisions were being being made, when the legislation was being written, there was not a black woman in the room with the expertise to say, no, this is not how it should be done. So you essentially have a room full of liberal white women discussing the representation of one of the most remarkable, exceptional black women of our time. And then we're invited after the fact, after these decisions are made. Mm -hmm. I will say for, um, in the defense of the Arts Commission, they didn't want a statue. So that's sort of where this must misunderstanding began. They didn't want a conventional statue. The Arts Commission does try to have some engagement with um, contemporary art. So the legislators thought one, wanted one thing, Arts Commission wanted something else. We came in thinking that we had full creative license to create a monument. And I know for me and for you too, because your your monument design was rooted in black aesthetics. It, I mean, there were some, some similarities in terms of um, geometries, architecture, that kind of thing. So um, we were looking at it from a different perspective. Like this is a progressive city. Let's give the city actually something new. But well, that's then- That's what they said that they wanted though. That's what they said that they wanted. That's what they said that they wanted. And I'm, I'm even thinking about this whole idea of a seat at the table, right? You said like this room filled with like white liberal, like, and, and actually it talks about the violences of feminism, right? Yes. And who is feminism? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Let's be honest. Let's be honest. And Let's it makes me honest. question that even if a black woman was in the room, would they listen to her? Would they still take that into account? So even when you have a certain form of visibility, does that always mean that your voice is going to be, you know, heard, even if you are at the table? Well, and what does that mean that 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 persistence um, of kind of silencing and saying, well, I know what's best and this is the right thing to do. It makes me think about Harriet Tubman and that conversation of her being put on the $20 bill, right? Right? Yes. <laughs> I remember, I remember like that being so problematic and people like, excuse me, like she would not want to be placed on money. Like she would not want to be placed on this currency that represents so much stuff. And also, if you put her on the $20 bill, then she's up there with all of the other presidents that have committed genocide. And you, you, hmm. so, you know, what does that mean? How is that reparative um, and restorative within itself? What does it mean to say, okay, we're going to have uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, but that's where all the crime happens in the city. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what does it mean to have these kind of cosmetic, we're talking about cosmetic right. kind of solutions to rectify intense traumas of history? Like, what does it mean to try to assert that? I rarely talk about um, my submission because I'm such a trickster and I was just like, Ooh, they ain't gonna pick this one, but I'm gonna see. <laughs> I'm gonna see what happens. And I, just like you, we were told that they were looking for a piece of art, right? And just it even thinks about like art being subjective. Art for who? Whose interpretation of art are we talking about? And what does that mean? Going back to the Clifton quote, I keep remembering mine. Mm -hmm. I'm really obsessed with the Benin bronzes because a lot of those were created for the Oba, because there was no photography, you know, yeah. that was not how they documented important moments that would happen in the courts, you know, whoever came to visit. So it's like, this is our form of, of, of visual storytelling, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's not taking a picture and saying this picture, even though it's been constructed, is truth. You know, this is right. a truth of some kind. And that's why I'm interested in a lot of those um, uh, colonial postcard images because they're all constructed and they're meant to be this kind of truth and they're meant to be benign and they're meant to, we talked about this. Um, and I remember I talked about this with my students, like, and also for you out there listening, why do public libraries have lions in front of them? What, is, what are the lions doing there? Like, I, I just really... <laughs> I don't get it. Like how people like stopped and thought about that. Like, what are these lions like protecting and this insistence upon lions and thinking about heraldry and like, you know, in, in England, there's so many coats of arms that have lions, but lions aren't indigenous there. Like, what does it mean to, you know, insist on taking certain tropes and saying, well, this, this is a truth and this represents power and we're gonna use this as an emblem of power so, and gatekeeping to kind of keep people out. Um, so in thinking about your relationship to the Benin bronze and like, this is how we choose to remember mm -hmm. and them saying like, nah, I don't have it like that. <laughs> we don't <laughs> want it like that. We don't want to remember like that. We need, we need, we want some folds of the fabric and for her to look like she just, and oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I'm just thinking about something lava. You remember Dr. Maya Angelou's son said that he really wanted imagery of his, his mother being a fighter and speaking to crowds of people. Oh, sorry, my alarm's going off to call my son. <laughs> She really, want, he wanted her depicted as a fighter, but the fact that that's what you did, you spoke to all of these crowds, everything was so viral in terms of you speaking to these like crowds of people and fighting on behalf of his mother and like how you know that she, her, her, her legacy and everything needed to be depicted. Um, you, at the time that I was, doing all of this, like in the throes of all of it, all I knew was that I could not let this go. 
all I knew, you know, my, my endeavor throughout the whole process was really to uphold the principles that Dr. Angelo embodied, justice, mm -hmm. integrity, courage, mm -hmm. and end to white supremacy, mm -hmm. equity. And, you know, in her writings, in her poetry, in her autobiography, she left a blueprint on how to deal. You know what I mean? She yeah, really all of us. Yeah. Exactly, for everyone. So, so for me, it was really like following the scripture of Dr. Maya yeah. in my approach to um, how to respond to this particular ordeal and challenge and also how to respond to people who really don't think deeply about what representation means mm -hmm. or what a symbol means or even what a monument is. It's unfortunate because the general public still has this preference for um, European statuary when it comes to monuments. I mean, white supremacy is so pervasive that, and this neoclassical ideal has held for centuries that when people think of monumentality, they immediately go to that form right. without ever considering other forms. And I've always been under, well, as an artist, I always think, you know, my job isn't to give the public what it wants. My job is to give the public a vision of what can be. Mm. And in the case of Maya Angelou, she was, she was a visionary. Mm. She was innovative. I mean, she was the first in so many ways. But when you just think about her person, she was wearing natural hair, African prints and clothing. She had a box in the 19, Yeah, she was calling herself Black mm -hmm. when... Black folks were calling themselves colored and were thinking of blackness as this derisive mm -hmm. um, term. So she was ahead of her time in so many ways. So how, you know, I, I'm just thinking, how are we going to constrain this woman who for me represents creative freedom, you mm -hmm. know, first creative freedom. How are we going to, why are we even considering constraining her in this, antiquated form oh my gosh oh my gosh love <laughs> oh my gosh i'm sorry i got so excited like okay okay so in your monument to dr maya angelou there's a fierce softness a quietness like just such power and also there's this idea that for some something to be monumental that it needs to be a horse charging and all of these things and they're just you know dominance you know like dominance. that is a figure that is dominating the situation and the fact that you put so much fierce gentleness it's kind of like um i don't know lioness energy how she's mm -hmm. like yeah i hunt for the pack and i'm just sitting here watching you i'm pretty but i'll bite you <laughs> So can you speak about that? Like even the aesthetics of like monumentality that even when we talk about the architecture of buildings, it has to be very big. It has to be these columns. It has to be a, a scale that engulfs you, you know, even going to Spain and looking at all of the cathedrals and seeing the little houses next to these like, okay, my head is like the cathedral and that's like the little house. And you know, you go in and it's just like, this sublime experience of like the power, you know, this awesome power that is greater than you. So what does it mean to like be confronted? Oh, and also thinking about the stereotype of the angry black woman too. Exactly. You know what I mean? And the fact, yes. that, <laughs> the fact that there's no performativity of, you know, the erotics of rage, which was, she was all about that, which was amazing but how you're capturing her. And she went to that library with her yeah. and her son. And the library is a space to be reflective and quiet. And just like, you know, she became a scholar at library. She read like all the books. So the fact that your monument has even that visual aesthetic that is completely different from our relationship to power and how power is performed. I think that that is completely radical. Just, you're a genius. You're a genius for that. Oh. 
Kenyatta. Like, seriously. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Oh, I'm not kidding. Kenyatta. Think about that. Like, just Thank really you. think about that. You know, for me, I was trying to capture, well, portraiture is powerful. And I was trying to capture a way, I was trying to convey a way for her to be represented in portraiture that um, would reflect the complexity of her interior. Yes. The complexity, because we don't get to be complex. Mm -mm. Now, black women, look, you talk about the stereotype of the ang angry black, you know, the, vix the vixen, the mm -hmm. angry black women. I mean, all these different parts of us that we, we embody all of them, but we rarely get to be all of them. And for her, since, since um, I took a screenshot of an interview, it was important for me to convey her thinking as well. Mm -hmm. It's like, what does brilliance look like? I mean, mm. what do we look like? Mm. When we're thinking, wow. there's so many images of her where she's smiling, where she's wow. laughing. You know, she's known as this very joyful, joyful individual. But, you know, she was vulnerable. Yeah. And, and it's she in was, her writing. It's yes. in all of her writing. And yes. that's, that's yes. what the world knows about her because, I mean, okay, there's so much that's coming up because when she decided to not use her language right because of what happened to her a right. traumatic incident and how she actually with withheld her own voice you know and kind of lived in that space in that world and to think about the quietude mm -hmm. of your monument i mean it's just <laughs> it's so layered it's like so much that's in there i really i'm obsessed with the show the underground i'm so angry that it got canceled for any of you out there, go binge watch the first season. Have you have you seen the Underground Lava? No. You have to watch it. Um, for me, it was a completely reconfiguration of, of enslavement and the Underground Railroad. And I'll never forget uh, what what is her name? Journey Smollett. She's in Lovecraft Country. I'm probably pronouncing. I know her who you're talking so about. <laughs> yes. Yeah, by you. Yeah, and yeah. all of that. But I'll never forget. Um, her father um, owned her and her family, right? So he had enslaved his, his daughter and uh, she ran away with a group of individuals and her pretty much her brother was sent to capture her or something of that nature. Okay. Uh, but no, 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 no. Her uncle was an abolitionist. So the family was split, you okay. know? And he's like, I'm trying to help my niece like go to freedom and fight my brother and his wife, you know. It, anyways, we, we that's complex. so much complexity. And I'll never forget, um, he hired a, a slave catcher. And when they captured her, you know, she was tied up and, you know, they he was saying, oh, like, this is your name, you fit the description. And she said, I'm more than just text on a wanted poster. My favorite color is yellow. I found a ribbon in the big house. I like to wear that. This is my favorite food. This is my, and when she's going into this whole monologue, I literally started crying, Yeah, you know? Yeah. And for me, that was that moment in history, you know, television writers, like really in the writing room, like, how do you talk about the complexity? Like, this is a human being. There's so much um, gentleness and, and just, just basic humanity. Like, right. I'm not just somebody's property. Once again, I belong to myself. I belong to myself. So as we're kind of talking about all of these like resonances, like I, I just keep thinking about that that residue of history. And what does that mean to belong to yourself and also thinking about hegemony what does it mean this is only valid if it looks like this this yes. is only valid if you talk like this this is only right. valid if you perform like this right um even just being in academia like i love to twerk but i'm not gonna be like hey well i just said i love to twerk in front of everybody but 
you know what I mean? Even I call it like my root chakra alignment. You know what yeah. I mean? That's yeah. how I yeah. do my embodiment for the day. But what does that mean to be an academic and to speak in that way? What does it mean to have to blur these boundaries and for people to have to understand you on your terms, not the other way around? And for people to not understand the violence in refusing to do so, you know? And it's like, why are we like fighting for just basic humanity? We said no. I mean, I kept thinking about lava like, oh my gosh. Dr. Mar Angelou was a sex worker. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, she she did all of these other things. She in no way had a life that was similar to any of the men, the men who were monumentalized, you right. know, in San Francisco. So what does that mean to be like, well, she's uh this is so bad. I'm going to use this terminology, like this thinking of this, like a kind of noble Negro, like she belongs, you know, in this Pantheon now. So she has to look exactly like us. Like, what does that mean to be, you know, welcomed into that space, but you have to erase everything that, that, that you are, you know, and also assuming when you talked about <sighs> monumental for who? So you're saying that it needs to look like this, but who is that for? Is that for the donor? Is that for, you know, all of these other components? Who is that for when you, you say know, it's It's interesting because, um, and I still don't understand why my particular monument design was so controversial because as far as I'm concerned, it's very um, conservative. You know, it's a, it's a portrait of my Angelo on a cover with a quotation of hers. Um, it's a portrait of her on a book, which is something that everyone recognizes. After all, she was an author. So in front of the library, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but yeah, there there was this this um, this campaign for her to be represented in a certain way that lifts, that that uplifts, you know what I mean? That tells the story of, you described it, the, the noble Negro or um, to be represented, represented in a way that um, is all about respectability or achievement or all of those things. It's like, is that the only way that we as black women um, get to be monumentalized is mm -hmm. if we are placed into that container that makes us worthy. And that's, that's a huge erasure because as you said, her life encompassed so many lives so, so many lives. And the truth is that the library and reading saved her. And when she talks about the library saving her and when she talks about reading, she talks about the complexity of human existence. She talks about the similarities of us as humans and our shared experience, our suffering, our strivings, our longings, she doesn't talk about this path toward achievement. Right, <laughs> you right. know, she doesn't. Right. She doesn't. No, she does. She talks about freedom. Right. She talks about daring. Yeah. She talks about courage. Conquering she talks fear. About living your full, living your full life, not oh. being um, put into this container or box to make someone else comfortable. Right. And that's what it is, essentially, yeah. other people's comfort. And then lastly, it makes me think of back to that belt buckle, you know, for one person, this may mean heritage, right? For another person, that means domestic terror. Yes. You yes. know, and so when you think about a monument and where it is erected, what I realized was that they weren't thinking about all the people who would look at it, you know? They were only thinking about who paid for it. <laughs> that I'm being this kind of like malice of their ego and being right. like, yes, we did this great thing, but who, who 
who's looking at it? Who is getting inspired by it? What does that mean? You know? Okay, so now we need to open it up to Q&A. This was so amazing, blah, blah. Sorry, I, I did my Oprah Winfrey voice. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, is that okay for us to open it up now? A lot of you all have been just, I mean, you all are in this conversation. This is so yeah. amazing in the chat, how you all have been just really, you know, responding to what we've been saying. There's actually more in the chat than it is in the Q&A. So I'm going to be going back and forth, hopefully. Um, the first comment that we have is, thank you so much for being with us. Much love at this moment in, our, in all of our lives. I mean, this is a historic day, the eve of the election, just all of that. So I actually want to thank everybody for being present. Cynthia Rose, thank you so much for coming. I love you, Cynthia. Um, this is a question for you, Lava. What does monument mean to you? It means, um, oh my gosh, you'd think I'd have a quick answer to this question, but I don't. I, and I have to answer it in the context of this, this project, because this is the first public art commission that I have, or first public art project that I've ever thought of or participated in. Um, but I, I will think about my, my um, prior, uh, some of my prior work. For me, it, it's a way to honor people, women, black women in particular, who have showed me how to be a better artist and human being. Mm -hmm. It's basically a way of honoring them. And even with um, my portrait project, the mugshot portraits, I think of those as private monuments. Yes. Because they have to be, they have to be protected, they need stewards, and that too was an act of like honor and commemoration. So that's what monument means to me, not dominance, not, not, not a way to dominate the, to landscape, the landscape or to make my mark upon the landscape, but really to honor the person um, that I'm representing. So a space for reverence and reflection. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, let's just say it out loud. Ancestral reverence. Ancestral reverence. Like, exactly. All about that Sankofa, like looking back and That's right. you know, look forward. Beautiful. Um, okay. Bridget Cox, thank you for tuning in. Our show is coming up. We're so excited. Um, thank you for your inspirational and validating presentations. Could you talk about your visions for amending monuments that still stand? Do you imagine artists having a role in reimagining reimagining current national monuments? Mm. Um, in Titus's TED talk, he said, "Not a race, but amend." And I thought that was so interesting. I'm going to be in a talk for um, Autograph. Um, I think it's Autograph BP. I pray that I'm saying that right. But there was a recent um, monument to King Leopold right, and all of the atrocities in the Congo, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The monument was taken to the dump like 40 years ago, and it was removed from the dump and re-erected. So there's this split in history between people who think that it's important to keep, you know, certain monuments up to talk about the legacy and there's other people that are like, you know, they've had their time through through just what my my ancestors went through. Me being a descendant, I'm a monument. You know, I'm a living monument of um, just surviving that. Like, do we really need him on his horse again, stinking? <laughs> you know, to remind us of history, like this kind of rotting like corpse that's like up there. So I don't know. I I, I think about that a lot, and also like, okay. Where, where are these statues going to go? What are they going to do? They're just going to be in storage forever? Like, what does that mean? I actually think that they should be re re Ooh, I don't know about that. But I'm thinking about, <laughs> I was like, re -re re-released, possibly back into the community for them to decide what they want to do. Similar to Scalpo, maybe the community should decide, like, 
what becomes of this person? Or what if they're melted down and they're reconfigured into something else? Like, I don't know. I don't know. That's a very good question, Bridget. What do you think, Lava? Oh my goodness. Um... I have forgotten the question. <laughs> okay, okay, no, okay. So your monument is an amendment to all of the different forms, the, the patriarchy, right? All of these- Yeah, exactly, exactly. Of important exactly, figures exactly. of history. Okay, so we're talking about that, but then what do you do with the ones that like still sit? Oh my gosh, like Brie, uh, what was her name? Brie Newsom, who took down the Confederate flag? Yes. To climb that pole and just yes. snatched, and snatched it, it down. And snatched it down. Just, boom. Took it down. You, you know, know, I have I have so many different thoughts about that. Like, okay, do we because if they're in storage, they're essentially paid. Someone is paying Ooh. for them to be stored. Mm -hmm. So someone is paying for their erasure. The okay. tax dollars probably are. Tax, exactly. Because <laughs> it's in the city. Yeah. Yeah. Literally our money paying for them to be stored somewhere. So I've always thought that there should be, there should be some place where they can all go in the public and then have actions enacted upon them. They'll pretty much kick their ass in public. You know, not so much that, but I mean, think about the ways that which which monument was that? Is it is it the um, General Lee monument that mm -hmm. has been graffitied over that mm -hmm. has portraits of um, Breonna Taylor, mm -hmm. George Floyd um, illuminated? Is that the one where the the black the dancers the dancers? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a way, I think, to reactivate them to mm -hmm. reconfigure them. Oh, um, reactivate. That's really intense. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that there is a way to do that that robs them of that, the original power that they were intended to have over the landscape and over the people that, that they were intended to dominate. But mm. that the community, whoever that community is, enacts our dominance over them. Hmm. Because I'm thinking about that term dominance. Like, do you meet dominance with dominance? Not do you always. Fight fire with fire. Sometimes. You know? <laughs> well, we kind of did it recently during civil unrest. It's like, <laughs> oh, you're going to fire on us, police. Yeah. So fire you know, you know like the fire next time that's a very good question i mean that could be a whole conversation series within itself it you know what do we do that's a part two. Oh my gosh lava that's a part two there we go that's a part two we're just gonna plug that in um this is a really great question um what did you think about or how did you decide which text to have on the monument it is so inspiring and right on this is by uh catherine mazur Oh, I read so much of her works and I was looking for, um, I was looking for a quote that, that really spoke to her, like the underlying philosophy of her work and that also tied that into the library. Mm -hmm. So when she talks about reading as a way to create empathy and reading as a way for us to understand not only our humanity, but someone's humanity in another country where we may never visit and someone who we may never meet. Mm -hmm. And that was just very powerful to me. It, that was extremely powerful to me. Mm. I love this question by Margaret Blair. What could you say about preserving our heritage in public spaces where there are no monuments or artworks to commemorate African-American communities in the displaced? Oh my gosh. So I remember talking to, uh, oh my gosh. Why is my memory? My memory is just like so fuzzy right now because there's so much stuff going on. Project Row Houses, he's one of the co-founders. Rick Lowe, Rick Lowe. Yeah. And we were out to lunch in Houston in 2012. 
and he was telling me about uh, Africa Town in Alabama. And so there was a bet that happened in which like way after uh, slavery was like uh, the, the trafficking in the Middle Passage and doing that, um, um, taking in enslaved individuals from ports like that was outlawed. There was a bet like, I bet you can't get a boat full of, you know, Africans in here, right? So um, the bet was made and the person was successful in bringing a whole fleet illegally. And somehow they got caught or figured out. So this is content one, this is very traumatic what happened, but so that they wouldn't be caught, like they torched the whole boat, right? Ship and a lot of people died, but some were able to get out and flee. And so I believe there were like seven founders of Africa Town where they, you know, now we're here under these circumstances. And he talked about like going into various geographies and walking around and getting like lost, you know, all over the world, just doing these walks. And he said he came across these like bust, you know, but they were so like, you know, misshapen, not cared for. And he realized that it was uh, commemorating, you know, what had happened. But because it was such a shameful history and people did not want to talk about what transpired, it, it kind of got, you know, swept under the rug. And so he came across this. He was like, no, I got to do something about this. Like, we, we really need to talk about this history. So that question, Margaret Blair, it really reminds me of that. Like, what does it mean to stumble upon history, to stumble upon the mm. undead, the unrested, the unknown? And to say like, okay, we got to do something about this. Does that mean pulling our own money? Does that mean doing a call in the community? Does it mean coming to these spots and places of trauma to sing and dance and, you know, reclaiming, you know, that area? I, I mean, there's just so many different um, ways to do that. And especially, you know, within a nation that insists on not doing that, you know, not giving resources towards that. Um, I belong to myself, like I'm my sister's keeper. <laughs> so like what does that mean Alice Walker oh my gosh um Zora Neale Hurston was in an unmarked grave Alice Walker found her mm -hmm. gave her a headstone and she is the reason why we read their eyes are watching God mm -hmm. in high school <laughs> mm -hmm. her homework exactly. so that's the way that you do it you know I mean, if it's an infrastructure where there isn't a, a care or a kind of importance, you know, for these people, like we got to be our own keepers. Mm -hmm. And Lava, that's what you and your monument and see Black women and just all of these things that transpired. I mean, that's literally what you did. Like everyone became, you know, our sister's keeper. And we're like, no, this is not going to stand. Right. With right. you leading the charge, literally like, oh, I'm going to say, <laughs> oh, hell no. <laughs> Hell no. And then um, we have two minutes left. What should we do? What should we do? Do we, should we take another question? Sure, sure, sure. Oh my gosh. Watch this gonna be one of those long, like deep questions and we're gonna be like, ugh. Um, <laughs> okay, let's see. What about the energy? This is Dana King's question. What about the energy that exists within the materials, the bronze, the stone of the plinth? How does that factor into a reconfiguration, reconstitution? Do you believe that that energy continues regardless of the form? Oh yeah, I'm a ghost lady, most definitely. <laughs> <laughs> most definitely. Um, a student that I was working with, Hosman uh, Torres, was doing this project uh, about re remelting down like guns, like guns that provided like a lot of violence in the neighborhood and like reconfiguring them into something else, like remelting them down, reconstituting them as something else. Um, yes, that energy is there, but also like the residue is everywhere. Like, what do you do with that? I mean, even in the midst of COVID, there, 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 there are so many people who, you know, Evanesced, you know, what do you do with that? What do you do with that, with those, with that energy, with these kind of epicenters of the um, pandemic? How do you still create a, a space for them? I'm wondering, will there be a monuments to people who passed away from COVID? Like, what does that, that wake work, you know, look like? What does that energy look like? I personally do not want um, 
a reconfigured statue of Christopher Columbus sitting in my house that is like a, a <laughs> paperweight or something. No, thank you. I don't want that. But it's still, what is it? Matter can neither be created or destroyed, right? Yeah. I yeah. think about that with history. So yeah. what does it mean to have an act of um, remembrance and insistence? Like it's not gonna go anywhere. So I think this is an ongoing question that I wanna task all of you, all of us to think about. What do we do with our dead? What do we do with our unrested? What do we do with, um, with the residue? What do we do with it? Where does it go? It has to go somewhere. But I would rather it be kind of whittled down to something smaller and a little bit more manageable than, <laughs> than for it to stay up with this like, I got my fly coat in my horse <laughs> and now I'm the best. You know, you can't do that anymore. I'm yeah. sorry. You right. have to come down. So I love that as a, as a final question though, because that's a lot to think about. Yeah, That's a lot to think about. I want to thank everybody for tuning in, for being here tonight. We will have like a transcript of the chat um, and it will be really powerful. I'm serious about a part two. It will be really, really powerful to, to think about um, a lot of these questions and just thank you all for being present today and your energy. Thank you, Lava. Oh, thank you for That's having amazing. me. You know, yeah. it was just really important that I, I'm really happy that I had an opportunity to talk about this the day that the vote came down and with you, because, you know, Kenyatta, I'll never forget, we were in the room talking about Toni Morrison's passing, yeah. getting ready to present for the Maya Angelou monument and hugging each other and just feeling the gravity of that, just feeling and, and really wishing each other well, yeah. you know, genuinely wishing each other well. Yeah. So that's, I'm glad that this day is ending on that sentiment. Yeah. And thank you for the opportunity to talk about it. No, you're so welcome. And I just wanna, and this goes to everybody like, it's the eve of the election, be safe, but also we're each other's keepers too. You yeah. know, like we are literally all in this together, whether we think it or not, whether we want to be or not, but this residue has to go somewhere and whatever happens tomorrow, um, we're still going to continue this work. It's still a lot of work to do, no matter who's in that seat of power and who's been in that seat of power, to be honest. Right. Um, so yeah, I'm just wishing everybody love, safety, care, think about these critical questions and discuss them with others. For me, that's the art, that's the conversation. And I'm just so, just grateful for everybody's presence on here. And I know we gotta go, it's 8.03. <laughs> <laughs> so be, be as well as possible, okay? Thank you everybody, good Thank night. You. Good night. <laughs>